Perhaps the most important factor for any ruler over any given country is the love of the people. After all, without the love of the people, a ruler is bound to be challenged, and if they are not strong enough, overthrown. So what happens when a ruler is not only beloved by his own people, but also the entire world, including his most mortal of enemies? The ruler capable of achieving such a feat came from an unsuspecting place and at an unexpected time. His name was Abdul Qadir al Jazariya, and his story is one of bravery, betrayal, and an unmoving sense of humanitarian fairness, even in the face of the most brutal of oppression. Abdul Qadir was born on September 6 of 1808 in Mascara province of modern day northern Algeria. From a young age, Abdul Qadir showed great potential, being able to read and write by the time he was five years old. And by the time he was 14, Abdul Qadir had memorized every single line of the Quran. This is very fitting, as his namesake was Abdul Qadir Gilani, the founder of the Qadari Sufi order that this Abdul Qadir happened to follow. His father's name was Mui al-Din, and he was a sheikh at the local Mascara Mosque. Mui al-Din made sure to give his son not only the best religious education, but he also pushed Abdul Qadir into learning the sciences, mathematics, local medicines, equestrian anatomy and care, and most importantly, history, and more specifically, the history of his very own ancestors. His father, and their fathers before him, believed themselves to be descendants of the Prophet Muhammad through Caliph Ali. By the time Abdul Qadr was 17, he was a talented and invoking orator. He was also unmatched in the saddle of a horse, being able to fire his musket at full speed and hit his target nearly every single time. At the age of 18, Abdul Qadr accompanied his father on his first Hajj to Mecca. This pilgrimage was more than 2,300 miles long, a more than four month long journey where he met many Muslims from all over the known world. Anyways, while on this journey, Abdul Qadr and his father also ventured north to the city of Baghdad, an Islamic center of both culture and art. Here in this city, Abdul Qadr would have something of a revelation as his father took him to see the grave of the very man that he was named after, Abdul Qadr Galani. After paying their respects to the man that had founded their own Sufi order, the pair ventured west, making a stop in Damascus, another ancient and important Islamic center. They once again visited the grave of a once great Sufi teacher. This time it was Ibn Arabi, whose teachings Abdul Qadr especially admired. After paying their respects, the father and son left, to return to their Algerian homeland, passing through Alexandria and coastal North Africa until finally reaching their Mascaran homeland in early 1828, after an absence of two years and three months. Upon their return, they would be welcomed back with a grand banquet. So large was the celebration that 15 oxen and 80 sheep were sacrificed for the feast. After his initial return, Abdul Qadr would take up a religious vow of seclusion, becoming a hermit in order to study not only the Quran, but also the works of Aristotle, Plato, and even people like Pythagoras. He also educated himself with any historical text that he came across, whether it be modern, ancient, eastern, or western. For the next two years, this voraciously well-read young scholar would accumulate a large personal library. But soon, Abdul Qadr would be forced to set his books down and abandon his scholarly pursuits in the pursuit of protecting his own Algerian homeland. On June 14th of 1830, Abdul Qadr's young life would change forever, as a French army of 34,000 landed in Algeria, intent on nothing less than conquest and colonization. For over 300 years, the Ottoman Empire had protected Algeria and neighboring Tunisia from the European powers. But now, this so-called sick man of Europe stood no chance against France who steamrolled and forced the Ottomans to abandon Algeria in under three weeks, leaving the locals to fend for themselves. The Algerian response would be an absent one, until January of 1838, after the French Expeditionary Army had taken much of the Algerian coast, including the large walled city of Oran. The capture of this city would finally prompt a local response. Mui al-Din, now an aged man, called for a jihad. Sending Abdul Qadr and his brothers out to announce the holy war and arouse the Algerian people onto their side. It is at this point that I will mention the tribal split among the Algerians at this point in time. 
They were largely split into two main groups, the Maraboots and the Dejuids. The Dejuids were the more interior tribes and focused heavily on a martial culture. Their tough desert landscape made them formidable hunters of both man and beast. The Maraboots focused their attention towards religion and learning and kept to the coast. Abdul Qadr was a Marabu, but it would soon become his duty to bridge the gap between the two groups in the face of a French invasion. On November 20th of 1831, the Maraboot tribe sent forth 10 of their leaders to discuss what to do against the invasion. After they all agreed to fight back, they voted for a leader among them to guide these Maraboot politically, religiously, and especially militarily. Mu'i al-Din was unanimously chosen by this council. The elderly man's first and last speech as the Emir of Mascara goes as follows. Since you insist on me being your sultan, I consent and abdicate in favor of my son, Abdul Qadr. Soon, an enthusiastic chant of Abdul Qadr filled the tent and eventually the whole camp. With the majority of the Marabout tribe supporting Abdul Qadr and the 10,000 cavalry that came along with these tribes, he set about in gaining recognition from the warlike Dejuid tribes in the south of Algeria. After all, it was these tribes who lived and died by the sword and musket. In under a year, the emir manages a successful unification, with very little blood spilled, relying on his oratory skills to convince the Dejuids to his side. The rift between these two tribes, once thought to be insurmountable, now united to fight off the French in full force, and they would prove to be just as competent as their new leader. Their first target was the important port city of Oran. Here, the emir would conduct his first of many nighttime cavalry ambushes that he would personally lead. He picked 100 of his best horsemen to ambush a French cavalry unit that moved under the cover of darkness to a nearby military outpost. He caught the Frenchmen by surprise, and most of them routed under the might of swift Algerian cavalry. Abdul Qadr, who killed a few that night, almost lost his life. In the heat of battle, a French cavalryman used his lance to thrust at the emir. Abdul Qadr would catch this weapon between his torso and left arm, missing his heart by mere inches. With his spear now stuck, the emir, with one saber chop, removed the man's head from his body. This was a victory, the first of many for the young and energetic emir, taking 30 Frenchmen as prisoners of war. Algerian climate and geography usually led to captured prisoners being executed on the spot. After all, it was expected that you would receive your share of the captured booty depending on how many severed heads hung from your saddle at the end of the battle. Emir Abdul Qadr would change all of this. In a time before the Geneva Accords, Abdul Qadr would set a humanitarian example in the art of war. Treating prisoners with respect and supplying them with food, shelter, and water in abundance. And when he could not supply these necessities, he would simply just release the prisoners. This man of great principle would actually frustrate the French government, who repeatedly tried in vain to paint Emir Abdel Qadr as a ruthless desert barbarian. The hypocrisy of this propaganda will soon be put on full display. Shortly after his nighttime skirmish, Mu'i al-Din would pass away. The very man that had given Abdel Qadr his position was now dead. This son intended to fulfill what his father had dreamed that he could do. So without stopping, Abdel Qadr would continue on his freedom-fighting path. He split his forces into several different contingents to besiege several different coastal forts in the Oran region. These were less of sieges as they were blockades as Emir Abdul Qadr had no artillery to retake these settlements. Instead, he stood poised to attack any who dare leave the safety of their walls. This tactic would miraculously lead to the French garrisons being starved out by both the forces of the Emir and the harsh climate of coastal Algeria. This near starvation would lead General de Michels, the overall commander of the French African Expeditionary Force, to seek a peace treaty with Emir Abdel Qadr. This treaty would be formalized on February 26 of 1834. The treaty would formally recognize Abdel Qadr's united Algerian tribes as a nation, either called the Emirate of Mascara or simply referred to as the Emirate of Abdel Qadr. This treaty would also give jurisdiction of the Oran region 
back to the Algerian forces. The French invasion, for the time being, had been halted in its tracks, and even completely pushed back in some places. But France still clung on to much of the eastern and western coastal edges of Algeria. This treaty was nothing short of a win, but nowhere near conclusive. They would be back, and Abdel Qadr, he would be prepared. Emir Abdel Qadr took this opportunity to consolidate his realm and create a centralized state with their own minted coinage and an official capital, the city of Tagdamt. The blockading campaign, while successful, would simply not work against a better supplied French army. To truly remove the French from their fortified positions, Abdel Qadr had to somehow acquire artillery pieces large enough to blast holes in his enemy's walls. For this, he did not trade, as you might expect. Instead, he simply hired Jewish, Muslim, and Christian engineers, tasking them with creating factories capable of making both 12 and 6 pound cannons. A total of four of these weapon manufactories would be created, the two most notable of which being in the cities of Mascara and his new capital of Tagdamt. This period of peace would also see the emir, who was by heart a scholar before a warrior, establish schools and add to his already impressive personal library. This personal library would soon become a public one, as he opened this knowledge to his people in Tagdamt. Those who brought books to the emir were rewarded quite handsomely for their service. Emir Abdel Qadr was not just a skilled warrior, but also a very capable administrator and organizer, a true jack-of-all-trades. As stated before, this peace had no hopes of lasting forever, and was broken within only a year and four months. Two local tribes in the northwest of Algeria had flipped sides and become subject to French rule instead of Abdel Qadr's. To accept these submissions was French general Camille Trezel. Amir Abdel Qadr saw this as an obvious break to the 1834 peace treaty that he had established with de Michels. He moved to reinstate his own control over these two tribes, sending a letter telling General Trezel to evacuate the area he occupied around the Sig River. He refused, and the Battle of the Sig River was now inevitable. On the 26th of June of 1835, General Trezel and a column of 2,500 infantry, cavalry, and cannoneers marched into the swampy landscape of the Moulay Ismail Forest. Almost immediately, this French force encounters a small number of Algerian infantry. Without hesitation, the French infantry fired upon these unsuspecting men but were surprised when these same men turned and opened fire on the French. This was just a signal, however, as the stomping of 8,000 hooves drowned out the echo of all the musket fire. They descended on the French column with an unprecedented speed and surrounded them on all flanks but their rear. But instead of retreating, General Trezel ordered for a defensive square formation and a continuous push forward after abandoning both their horses and supply wagons. By night, this square of men reached the Sig River, having lost 52 men. They made camp, but remained restless throughout the night. General Trezel intended to follow the Sig River all the way to the port city of Arzwi. Abdel Qadr waited in ambush between this city and the French force. There was a confluence ahead of Trezel where two rivers met. The ground here was a stinking humid swampland. The remaining French artillery, and even the wounded, would be left behind. As Abdel Qadr started his second ambush here, the wounded would be killed, along with 125 more Frenchmen, for a total of 314 dead. By the time Trezel had fought his way to Arzwi, it was well past dusk and into night. And after three days of non-stop fighting, the French trickled their way out of the forest, with no cohesion, on a full-scale route. Abdel Qadr had won, but at the cost of a resumption of warfare against a foe, who outnumbered and outgunned this tiny Algerian emirate. General Trezel would then be stripped of his command and replaced by several different generals over the next year, with all of them finding very little to no success. That is, until the French Marshal, Thomas General Bugod, was sent to quash this emirate. On July 7th of 1836, he won a long-awaited for French victory and continued on a largely successful six-week-long campaign at the towns of Morocco and in the Emirate of Abdel Qadr, 
in the west of Algeria. After this campaign, he returned to France for elections of the Chamber of Deputies, which he would win in the following year of 1837. The goal of France during this war was to not only conquer and subjugate the native population, but to also colonize and resettle Frenchmen in North Africa. This they had started while the war was still going on, and this Abdel Qadr would take full advantage of. From May 8th and all the way to May 30th of 1837, no less than five raids were conducted by Emir Abdel Qadr against French colonizers. This flurry of attacks would force the hand of Thomas General Bugard, who received the news while still in France. So on May 30th, he drafted the Treaty of Tafna, which would give almost total control of Algeria to Emir Abdel Qadr, with the French only holding on to a few coastal forts. Once again, through guerrilla tactics and swift warfare, the Emir had removed French influence from much of Algeria. Peace would again reign over the Mascara Emirate, peace that both parties knew would once again be broken. But for now, this peace was celebrated, as chants of the victorious Emir filled whatever village or town he found himself in. During this time, Abdel Qadr expanded further south to consolidate even more Algerian tribes and bring more men under the Emir's banner. He also constructed forts further inland and protected by the hot desert instead of near the coast where the French could easily supply their besieging armies. This would also have the added benefit of subduing any kind of resistance posed to his rule by any inland Jewish tribe. The peace would once again be broken on October 18th of 1839 under the command of Crown Prince Ferdinand Philippe left the French controlled town of Mela entering the Iron Gates of Algeria a mountain pass in the north of Algeria that signified the border set forth by the Treaty of Tafna. With illegally forged passports, the army peacefully passed through the Iron Gates and into the interior of Algeria. Upon hearing of this illegal entry into his emirate, Abdel Qadr rode day and night north. A journey that would normally take a week from Tagdemp to Medea was made in only three days. Upon arriving, the emir sends a letter to the prince and warns him that he will attack, not only him, but all French garrisons and stations in North Africa. Only 10 days later, multiple Algerian generals fell on the French colonizers who settled on the plains of Matija, destroying farms and scorching the land. Prince Philippe would be recalled to France shortly after reigniting this conflict. France would again officially declare war on Abdel Qadr on November 18th of 1839 after more than two years of peace. Abdel Qadr had a limited time to act before an official French expeditionary force would be sent to Algeria. He quickly returned to Tagdemt, acquired his personal wealth of gold, silver, and even his prized family jewels, and sold all of them to fund this new war that he found himself in. He then proceeded to raise 30,000 men to his cause, marching north to weaken the French strongholds before they had time to reinforce their coastal cities. Before Abdel Qadr could take any of these cities, the French army arrived in February of 1841, consisting of 85,000 men under a familiar face, General Thomas Bugard. This time, he had no intentions of peace treaties or compromises. He only sought to demolish this upstart emirate from the ground up. One quote from the general can define the next seven years of this war. I will enter your mountains. I will burn your villages and your harvests. I will cut down your fruit trees. By doing this, he would be scorching the already barren desert landscape of Algeria. To combat these overwhelming and utterly destructive odds, Abdel Qadr preferred to conduct a guerrilla campaign, using his mobility to attack and disappear at a moment's notice. This was effective, but did not stop the tsunami of French soldiers who poured into the land and brutally massacred his towns, villages, and eventually all of the inland forts that he had worked so hard to construct during peace. By 1842, Amir Abdel Qadr was forced into the countryside, with General Bagad having occupied his towns and cities. To disrupt the guerrilla tactics of the Amir, the French general ordered for a series of roads to be laid, connecting the various French garrisons and limiting the movement of the Amir severely. The situation was a dire one, made even more dire by Henri d'Orléans, the brother of the previously mentioned Prince of France. In the month of May of 1843, he 
along with only 500 French cavalry, had discovered the elusive and always moving camp of Amir Abdel Qadr. An Algerian soldier had betrayed Abdel Qadr, revealing the camp to be at a nearby spring called Teguin. In the middle of the day, 500 horsemen advanced on a camp that numbered nearly 30,000. The forces of the Emir, who were caught off guard, scrambled and ran from this force. Emir Abdel Qadr and the bulk of his army were conducting a raid, leaving his camp weak and unguarded. These 500 Frenchmen captured not only more than 3,000 Algerians, but also the Emir's large treasury. Perhaps most importantly, Henri d'Orléans seized the impressive library that Abdel Qadr had been assembling since his childhood. This was a huge blow to the rebellion, and at the mercy of only 500 men. Still, Abdel Qadr persisted in his defense of Algeria, falling deeper and deeper into his interior as he did so. Say what you want about Prince Henry de Orleans, but never call him a coward. Abdel Qadr, hoping for a chance to recover from his losses, ventured west into neighboring Morocco. With many Algerian tribes being forced into submission, Abdel Qadr turned to his Moroccan brothers for both sympathy and assistance. This plan, however, would backfire and ultimately lead to a French invasion of Morocco in 1844. The French promised to cease this invasion under one condition. They wanted Abdel Qadr dead or alive, and they wanted the Moroccans to do their dirty work. With little choice in the matter, the Moroccan Sultan obliged, sending an army to face Abdel Qadr's shrinking but still elite force. These soldiers were easily defeated by the veteran warriors under the Emir. This attack prompted the Emir to return to Algeria. Frustrated, the Moroccan Sultan sent forth a skilled and physically strong assassin to cut the head off this Algerian snake. The Emir, in a common sight, had his head buried in a book. Looking up, he came face to face with this assassin and his own death. The assassin, with an astonished look, paused, throwing his dagger, not into the Emir, but instead into the ground. He quickly exclaimed, I was going to strike you, but the sight of you disarmed me. I thought I saw the halo of the prophet on your head. Abdul Qadr's very appearance now reflected the ethics of the man who laid beneath. In 1845, Lieutenant Colonel Lucien Francis de Montanag was sent to the Algerian front. Previously in 1832, he was awarded the Legion of Honor Medal, but refused it, stating, I will await this award on an occasion that I better deserve it. Never again would he better deserve this highly sought after medal, unless you count massacring Algerian non-combatants and citizens as deserving. Lieutenant Colonel de Montanag was ruthless during his short time in Algeria. Ruthless and idiotic. On September 22nd of 1845, after one of these massacres, the colonel and the 540 light infantry under his command began a march to their next target. While passing a Sufi monastery, they were suddenly beset upon on all sides by hundreds of fast-moving Algerian cavalry led by Abdel Qadr himself. This was the Battle of Sidi Brahim. Colonel de Montenog in a first of many terrible decisions, decides to stand his ground, allowing himself to be surrounded with nothing separating his small force from that of the Algerian one. This would result in the capturing or death of 458 French soldiers. After this blunder, the colonel then made the correct decision to retreat into and fortify the nearby monastery along with his remaining 82 men, a decision that he should have made the second that he heard the stomping of hooves. The French were now outnumbered, surrounded, and had very little food, water, and ammunition. Amir Abdel Qadr offered surrender and humane treatment multiple times over the next two days, with the stubborn colonel refusing on every occasion, still chasing that medal of honor. The French held a strong, easily defendable position in the monastery, but soon ran out of ammunition. To solve this, the colonel ordered for his men to start cutting their musket balls into smaller pieces for more ammo. If you know anything about aerodynamics or just guns in general, then you would know that this is nothing short of a terrible idea. These fragmentary lead pieces would be highly inaccurate and nearly ineffective. He might have been better off just stuffing sand in his barrel instead. Despite this, however, one of these musket balls 
would find Abdul Qadr, but it would only cut his right ear into pieces, just like the musket ball that struck him. After two days in the monastery, the 80 remaining Frenchmen were completely out of provisions, so on September 25th, they made one last ditch effort, a bayonet charge, directly into the midst of Abdul Qadr's horsemen. This charge, while extremely heroic, was very unnecessary. Only nine would survive it. Colonel Lucien Francis de Montenag was not one of them. This was a complete victory for Abdul Qadr. Unfortunately for him, it would be the last one that he would experience during this war. The victory was short-lived, as it would prompt for the return of Marshal Bagad at the head of a 120,000 strong French army. This was the beginning of the end of the Algerian resistance. In only two years, Abdel Qadr's once great force of 30,000 had been reduced to only 2,000, with nothing in the form of a reserve pool. On December 23rd of that year, the Emir, weary of war, physically and unwilling to watch his country be torn apart anymore, surrendered his noble jihad. He did this on one condition, that he would be able to live the rest of his days out in Alexandria, Egypt. On Christmas Day of 1847, his surrender was made official by a meeting between him and Prince Henry de Orléans, who decided to give Abdel Qadr the gift of imprisonment. The man who had stolen his books and camp now betrayed and stole his very freedom. A dishonorable end to an honorable war. He would immediately be shipped off to France, along with his family and closest followers for imprisonment. He arrived at Toulon in southern France a day before the new year. He only spent about three months here as he was then shipped west to Pau, a city on the edge of the Pyrenees Mountains. 1848, regarded as the year of revolution in Europe, would have the effect of the overthrowing of the King of France and the reinstitution of a French Republic. While passing through Bordeaux, the citizens, having heard of the fairness and mistreatment of Abdel Qadr, lined the streets as his escort pressed forward. With his fame growing, the citizens put Abdel Qadr's name as a presidential candidate for the year of 1848. Just imagine that, an Algerian emir as the president of France. This would of course not happen as the nephew of the late Napoleon Bonaparte, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, would win and become the president of the Second French Republic, much to the advantage of Abdel Qadr. Louis Napoleon would do anything to win the favor of the French people, which is why he would convene a meeting on January 14th of 1849 to discuss the possible release of the popular Abdel Qadr. This would not change the mind of the French cabinet, but he was sent to a much more luxurious prison in central France called the Ambrose Chateau, just outside of Paris. Abdel Qadr would spend the next three years of his life here. During his time, you could constantly find him preaching and teaching the Quran to his guards. A majority of the men who were supposed to be guarding him ended up converting to Islam. If that isn't a testament to Abdel Qadr's oratory skill, then I don't know what is. So popular was Abdel Qadr that an Irish racehorse was named after him, rather befitting, as all could attest to his equestrian mastery. This horse, nicknamed Little Abd, was just like his namesake, as he was considered the underdog. At the 1850 Grand National Race in Liverpool, England, he would shock the world. His odds were 20 to 1, but despite this, he would go on to win the race, adding more fame to the wrongfully imprisoned Abdel Qadr. In the next year of 1851, Little Abd would once again win the Grand National, the first horse to ever win this race two years in a row. On October 16th of 1852, after five years of being wrongfully imprisoned, Abdel Qadr was released on the order of President Napoleon and soon to be Emperor. To compensate for this lost time, he was granted a yearly stipend of 100,000 francs. In exchange, he would never again set foot in Algeria. Louis Napoleon also granted him one of his own horses, a pure white Arab horse of large stature. He handed the reins of the horse to Abdel Qadr, saying, This horse is yours. I hope it will make you forget that you have been so long without one. On December 21st of 1852, Abdel Qadr boarded the Labrador, and finally left France, his destination being the Ottoman Empire, where he wished 
to live out the rest of his days among fellow Muslims. First, he would move to Bursa, where he would live for three years, until growing tired of the place. Then in 1855, he would travel back to a city where he and his father had stopped in some 30 years ago, Damascus, resting place of his theological idol, Ibn Arabi. Like Ibn Arabi and the younger version of himself, Abdul Qadir would again devote his life to a scholarly pursuit, rebuilding his grand personal library that he so cherished, adding two books written by himself to join that growing shelf, one being a philosophical work. The other was the combination of the two things that he loved the most, horses and literature. He penned a guide to the Arab horse, from birth to training and all the way to death. While living in Damascus, Abdul Qadir resided in a large house and near palace-like structure that dominated the street that he resided on. This he could afford with his annual 100,000 francs. Along with Abdul Qadir was his wife, some of his children, and a surprising amount of his Algerian companions and followers. These men and their families still regarded Abdul Qadir with the same respect that they had given him while he was the emir. Companions who had once been alongside the emir on the battlefield now retired their scimitars and long muskets for a tranquil life of study. Or so they thought. A new jihad would soon call these veterans out of retirement. In the spring of 1860, the Druze of Damascus and Lebanon started to riot in the streets, killing any Christians that they could get their hands on. The Druze are largely an Arabic ethnic group who follow a religion that is a blending of all major world religions. The Christians of Lebanon and these Druze had long been at each other's throats. Abdul Qadr even warned the French of the oncoming slaughter. They did not listen. The Ottoman government even egged on this rioting, attempting to religiously cleanse the area once and for all. In the month of May, Abdul Qadr met with the Ottoman governor of Lebanon on three separate occasions. All times, he was assured that nothing but peace would perforate in Lebanon. All the while, tensions continued to bubble, until it popped on the 9th of July, 1860. In the late morning, Abdul Qadr's faithful followers bursted into his home, quickly informing him that the Druze had started to riot and murder innocent Christians. Without a hesitation, Abdul Qadr leapt up, grabbing his retired sword to dispense justice one last time. After gathering his men and sons, he proceeded down the Damascus streets. Following the screams and flames to find the rioting mob, Abdul Qadr's Algerians, which numbered some 1,000 men, then drew themselves up on the street, holding a defensive position to block the Druze mob. One Druze man stepped forward, saying, You, the great slayer of Christians, are you come out? to prevent us from slaying them in our turn? Abdul Qadr, his voice booming, yelled back, If I slew Christians, it was in accordance with our law, Christians who had declared war against me and were arrayed in arms against our faith. This mob pushed past and around Abdul Qadr's men. He, in turn, let them pass, as he did not want to shed unnecessary blood. By the time he looked back, the Christian quarter was already raging in an infernal blaze. The Algerians raced there, going house to burning house, calling forth any Christian and hurriedly escorting them back to Abdul Qadr's home. Thousands of Christians now crammed in his residence and thousands more joined them over the next 10 days, among them being a French consul, a British diplomat, and even a Russian diplomat. To inspire his Algerians, Abdul Qadr would repeatedly say, this is as much a jihad as when we fought the French in our homelands. One Christian, saved personally by Abdel Qadr, said, Abdel Qadr appeared, surrounded by Algerians, around 40 of them. He was on horseback and without arms. His handsome figure, calm and imposing, made a strange contrast with the noise and disorder that reigned everywhere. Altogether, Abdel Qadr would claim to save 15,000 Christians, who the majority of would have surely joined the 3,000 that he could not save. For this, Abdul Qadr's fame grew to celebrity levels, and thanks for this deed, started to pour in. His annual 100,000 francs was increased to 150,000 francs by Emperor Napoleon III. The emperor also gifted him the highest possible medal, the Royal Order of the Legion of Honor Medal. He was also awarded the Grand Cross of the Redeemer from the recently independent Greek nation, 
a star of magnificence from the French Freemason Society that he was a member of, the highest level of the Medigier Medal from the Ottoman government that he shared with only 49 others. Perhaps most surprisingly, he was awarded the Medal of Pope Pius IX, the highest award given by the Pope, and rarely given out to Muslims. One year later in 1861, President Abraham Lincoln sent him two golden inlaid pistols. These are just some of the many medals awarded to him for saving the Lebanese Christians. In January of 1863, Abdel Qadr went on a Hajj to Mecca, nearly 40 years after his first. He would return in 1864 and would leave for another pilgrimage a year later, having been invited to France to meet with his savior, Napoleon III. In 1867, a cousin of Winston Churchill, Colonel Charles Henry Churchill, met with Abdel Qadr so that he could write his autobiography, publishing it in that same year, calling it The Life of Abdel Qadr. In 1869, Abdul Qadr met another famous Muslim resistance leader in Mecca whilst performing the Hajj. This was none other than Imam Shamil, the man who had stifled Russian ambitions in the Caucasus region for 25 years. Shamil had used guerrilla warfare tactics in Dagestan and Chechnya to defeat numerous Russian armies sent to pacify him. But by 1859, the Russian military machine had overwhelmed his muted movement forcing Shamil to surrender to the Tsar's forces. A decade later, he was given permission to perform Hajj where he met a kindred spirit in Abdul Qadr. The two old warriors discussed many topics. They did, after all, have much in common. Both had fought resistance struggles against aggressive European empires. Both were also adherents of Sufi Islam and subsequently discussed theological matters as well. Shamil would leave Mecca soon after and go to nearby Medina, where he died in 1871. To learn more about the epic life story of Imam Shamil and the resistance he led in the mountains of Dagestan and Chechnya, check out the documentary I just released on him over on my channel Hikma History. Back to you Stoic History. The former Emir would return to his books and scholarly pursuits in Damascus, passing away on May 26 of 1883 at the age of 74. The presence of Abdel Qadr is even felt here in America. Only 600 miles away from me is the town of Al Qadr, Iowa, founded in 1847 and named after the Algerian Emir. To conclude on Abdel Qadr, none could say better of him than his own autobiographer, Colonel Charles Churchill. The last paragraph of the life of Abdel Qadr goes as follows. Those who have pursued the preceding pages will have found many grounds for salutary reflection. In the example there laid before them, they will have been profitably reminded of the utter short-sightedness and uncertainty of all human calculations. They will, at the same time, have been instructed, edified, and encouraged by the striking proof which it affords that the only really strengthening and peace-giving motives of human action are a practical and preserving sense of duty, and a humble, cheerful, submissive, and unswerving trust in God. France has, for a very long time, had interests in the land known as Tunisia. The first act of this interest came unsurprisingly from the Normans. They conquered a large portion of the coastal region, setting up the short-lived Kingdom of Africa, which only lasted a few decades in the mid-11th century. In 1270, King Louis IX, the only French king to be named as a saint, called the Eighth Crusade and invaded Tunisia. After landing, he would die of dysentery and his crusade would fail. In 1390, what would become to be called the Barbary Crusades would begin. This pitted the Barbary pirates of North Africa against a combined French and Genoan force. After a failed siege, they would be forced back onto their boats. After this, France took a step back from their Tunisian interests. In this time, another power stepped in to do what the French could not. The Ottomans conquered Tunisia and Algeria in 1574. They would remain as an Ottoman territory for the next 260 years. In 1830, the Ottomans would be forced to leave. France was back, this time intent on nothing less than imperial conquest. The French invaded Algeria. After a fight with an Ottoman army, they continued their conquest. 
The Ottomans, now on the run, evacuated Algeria and Tunisia, leaving the locals to their fates in the hands of the French. Algeria, under their noble emir, Abdel Qadr, would attempt to unite and fight off the French invasion. After a series of wars that lasted for 17 years, from 1830 to 1847, Amir Abdel Qadr was forced to surrender. All of Algeria would then become a French colony. As for Tunisia, after the Ottoman departure, they became largely an independent state. Although an independent state caught in between two world superpowers, officially known as the Beylik of Tunis, they were ruled by their bey, who acted largely the same as an autonomous king. In 1837, perhaps the most infamous Bey of Tunis was crowned on October 10th. His name was Bey Omad, and he would attempt to rapidly modernize Tunisia. He abolished slavery, set up schools, improved infrastructure, but most importantly, he tried modernizing the Tunisian army and navy. This would put Tunisia in a mountain of unsustainable debt that his descendants would be forced to try to claw their way out of. Meanwhile, near his capital of Tunis, a church named after a foreign king was being built. After France invaded Algeria in 1830, they made a deal not to attack the Beylik of Tunis if they gave them land to construct a monument to Louis IX, their saintly king who had died in Tunisia after invading it. The first stone of this church would be laid in 1840. The construction project would end well after the French conquest of Tunisia. This church, built in the name of a French invader, showed the true intentions of France more clearly than anything else could. In 1855, the modernizing Bey Ahmad would die, his throne passing on to his cousin, Bey Muhammad II. He would only reign for four years from 1855 to 1859, his only significant contribution being the Fundamental Pact of 1857. This would ensure religious freedom and equality of all his subjects. He was really only following the lead of the Ottomans, however, who passed a similar law in that previous year. Bey Muhammad II would die on September 22nd of 1859. He would be succeeded by his brother, who was also named Muhammad. His full name was Muhammad as Sadiq. To distinguish him from his brother, he would then be referred to as Bey Sadiq. He would be the last independent Bey of Tunis. In 1861, two years into his reign, Bey Sadiq does something groundbreaking. On the 23rd of April, he puts forward the first written legal constitution in the Arab-speaking world. His government would be based on the American model, with judiciary, executive, and legislative branches. This constitution also gave Muslims and non-Muslims alike the right to buy, sell, and own property. This drove the interests of European businessmen, especially the French and British, who started flooding in, seeking economic opportunity. Some, namely the majority local Muslims, were not so happy about this constitution. The constitution also acted as a military reform, requiring all men who could not pay their way out of it to be enlisted in the military for a total of eight years. This left the poor, who had to serve, angered by this new government, and trained militarily. Bey Sadiq had managed to frustrate the two largest overlapping groups in Tunisia, the Muslims and the poor. Tensions then rose into an eventual civil war that started in 1864. Bey Sadiq was forced to hire a group of exiled Algerian mercenary fighters, called the Zwawa, who had found refuge in Tunis following the French-Algerian conquest. This drove Tunis into even more debt that was already growing as the rebels took the countryside. French, British, and Italians all nearly stepped in to stop this rebellion, undoubtedly for their own personal gains. France even went as far as stationing an army right on the border shared between Algeria and Tunisia. The Ottomans, to a small degree, assisted Bey Sadiq, and this would eventually lead to his victory over the rebels in 1865. In an effort to repair his broke and now war-torn country, Bey Sadiq continued seeking out more loans. 
From Cairo to Istanbul and all the way to Paris, he took out loans from Jews, Muslims, and Christians alike. By 1865, Tunisia was well into over 200 million francs in debt. That's more than 16 trillion US dollars in modern estimates. This is an absurd amount to expect a small nation such as Tunisia to pay back. In January of 1866, the French banks called. They wanted their money back. After a poor harvest season, Tunisia was in no place to pay. Instead, they took another loan to the tune of another 100 million francs. By 1868, the situation had worsened further. Now, they couldn't even partially pay back any of their loans, and banks simply stopped lending them money. Tunisia was bankrupt. They were now at the mercy of the banks. In 1869, the International Debt Commission of Tunisia was set up. They would take control of the entirety of the Tunisian tax system. The members of this debt commission were mainly European, and they had just turned Tunisia into an unofficial debt colony. Tunisia would never pay off its debt, although in name, it would remain independent. The final nail in the coffin would come in 1878 at the Congress of Berlin. This was a meeting that split Africa between the European colonial powers. Among the many European countries that attended was France, and they received the second most land from the countries they did not yet own. Among the countries that France claimed was Tunis and North Morocco. The British would take the other half of Morocco in the south. In 1880, France occupied Senegal, and next looked towards their already claimed territory in Algeria. In 1881, France found a reason to invade and take Tunisia, and own it more than just fiscally. Their casus belli was the 3,000 Zouawa mercenaries that Bey Sadiq had hired to help quell his civil war. Most had remained in Tunisia after the war's end. Supposedly, these former mercenaries began raiding French settlements in Algeria. Supposedly. French sources are the only ones for these attacks. The French were really trying to just continue their Algerian war in Tunisia by blaming the same people who they had fought against more than 30 years ago. The invasion began on the 28th of April, 1881. 2,800 French soldiers under General Leonard Leopold Forgamel started advancing towards the city of Tunis from Algeria. He appointed the command of the invading force to another general named Jules Amy Briart. They would first conquer the northern peninsula of Tunisia, with the exception of the city of Tunis itself. After three days of being surrounded by French forces, Tunis would also surrender. On May 6, Bey Sadiq received the Treaty of Bardo. In it, France demanded that Tunis become a protectorate of France, which is all but a colony. But the Beys would still remain as a ruler with no powers. Bey Sadiq took the treaty to think about it alone for a few hours. He took it to his government and prime minister, a man named Mustafa Ben Ismail. They both wanted to accept it. Some of their government took their side. The rest began to raise arms against the French invasion. Bey Sadiq then surrendered and signed the Bardo Treaty. Although by the rules of his own constitution, he didn't have the authority to do so alone. No matter the case, Tunisia would become a protectorate on May 12th of 1881. On June 10th, the conflict would really begin. Most of the unconquered southern section of Tunisia revolted. The city of Cairion was the epicenter of the rebellion. The French Prime Minister, Jules Ferry, would order for more troops to be sent to quell these rebellions. 3,600 soldiers would be sent, and six ironclad battleships that Tunisian boats could do nothing about. After a bombardment, the coastal city of Sfax surrendered. The 3,600 French soldiers quickly marched to the center of the rebellion, Carillon. The city surrendered without a fight, after seeing the odds that they were up against. The last two strongholds of Gafsfa and Gabez fell a few weeks later after a short fight. Tunisia was firmly in the hands of France. Bey Muhammad III Sadiq would die not even a year later, at the age of 69. He had no children, as he was rumored to be homosexual. The throne, for the third time in a row, would be passed onto the son of Bey Hussein II, who died in 
He was forced to sign more treaties by the French, which took away any kind of political authority that he still might have had. By 1883, Tunisia was all but a French colony. Seven years later, the St. Louis slash King Louis IX Cathedral was completed on the first land in Tunisia that France owned, thus completing the crusade that King Louis IX had started more than 600 years ago. Tunisia was one of those unfortunate, smaller countries in the 19th century that just couldn't industrialize themselves fast enough. Smushed between the Ottomans and French that both wanted them, and who they were both in debt to, the takeover was first through the banks, and then suddenly, as Europe split them in a conference that they weren't even invited to. Tunisia would remain as a French colony until 1956, when an ancestor of Sadiq Bey, Mohammed VIII, became the first and only king of Tunisia. After a reign of only under a year, he was deposed, and a Tunisian republic was declared that still lasts to this very day. The year is 1830. France has just invaded Algeria. The Algerians begin to unite and fight back against the French under their emir, Abdel Qader. He holds them off for 14 years before his situation becomes untenable. Amir Abdel Qader then retreats into Morocco. What would you do as the Moroccan Sultan, Abdel Rahman? You would likely lose to France in a war, but you also don't want to be neighbors with these conquering colonizers. You decide to take in Amir Abdel Qader and his army. After all, what's the worst that can happen? Boom, France just blew up your city. Boom, and another one. And boom, there goes another. You immediately sign a peace treaty with France and force Abdel Qader back to what was left of his Algeria. France had made it clear that day in 1844 that they were not here to make friends. France also forces Morocco to give them this chunk of land on their eastern end. Three years later, in 1847, Amir Abdel Qader finally surrendered to France. Morocco was now neighbors with not only France, but also Spain. There are two cities on the North Moroccan coast, one named Ceuta, the other Melilla. Spain owns them both, and still does, and at this point, has for a few hundred years. Sharing land borders with European countries in the 19th century is just not where you want to be. Both of these colonial powers, one rising, the other waning, look to make a colony out of Morocco. Morocco's strategic position, acting as the northwestern gateway to Africa, was something to be desired. On top of these two untrustworthy neighbors, Sultan Abdel Rahman had his own internal problems to contend with. The most crucial of these being a devastating famine that had started in 1845. After six years and six bad harvests, the Moroccans were still starving. Some decided to take this matter into their own hands. In 1851, the Moroccan coastal city of Saleh would open fire on a French merchant vessel carrying supplies from Algeria. The Moroccans sank the ship and managed to capture some food so they wouldn't starve. The French saw this as an act of piracy and brought five ships to bombard Saleh. They end up hitting the 800-year-old Grand Mosque in the city. The Moroccans responded with gunfire back, managing to punch holes into two of the boats, killing a total of four French sailors. The bombardment of Saleh managed to destroy most of the coastal artillery and killed a total of 20 Moroccans. A treaty was then hurriedly signed by Sultan Abdel Rahman, who was forced to pay off the French with 100,000 francs. With this, Franco-Moroccan relations simmered back down to its usual uneasy, but peaceful. Sultan Abdel Rahman scrambled to find outside help. This he found in one of France's oldest enemies turned ally, the British Empire. In 1856, the Anglo-Moroccan Treaty of Friendship was signed. While it moved Morocco closer to the protection provided by the British Empire, it also weakened Morocco internally. It ended the Moroccan royal monopoly over the gold and guano trade. During the 19th century, Europeans were going crazy to acquire more guano. But what is guano exactly? Well, fossilized bat poop. Guano acted as the perfect fertilizer, and it just so happened that Morocco was full of it. Opening their borders to nearly all free trade with the British Empire ensured their safety, 
but also ensured a rising trade deficit. Three years later, in 1859, Sultan Abdul Rahman died at the age of 81. In the months prior to his death, the Spanish cities bordering Morocco, Ceuta and Melilla, started complaining about raids from the native Berbers from the Reef Mountains. Mid-negotiation, after finding out about the death of Sultan Abdul Rahman, the Spanish decide to drop the act and simply invade Morocco. They sent the new Sultan an impossible ultimatum that included ceding even more land to Spain in order to act as a buffer around the city of Ceuta. Sultan Muhammad IV, son of Abd al-Rahman, rejected. Spain immediately sent an army to Ceuta and defeated the Moroccan army after besieging the city of Tehuatan. So it was, only a few months after Sultan Muhammad IV's ascension, that he signed a treaty of peace with Spain. Both enclaves of Ceuta and Melillo would be given more of a buffer zone. The Spanish also received the Chafranas Islands, just east of Melilla. Much farther to the south, Morocco also ceded the city of Sidi if need Spain. This was, however, a colonial return to the area for Spain. Nearly 400 years ago, the lord of the Canary Islands, a man named Diego Garcia de Herrera, built a fort near Sidi Ifni. Herrera had married well, and through his wife, Queen Inez Peraza of the Canary Islands, he acted as her own personal general. Lord Herrera showed up in Morocco for two reasons. The proximity of Sidi Ifni when compared to the Canary Islands, and unfortunately, slaves. That's right, Sidi Ifni was a founding city of the early transatlantic slave trade. And now, in 1860, Spain reclaimed the same land. Worst of all for Morocco, they were forced to pay Spain an insane amount in war reparations. They put the 100,000 francs paid to France only 16 years ago to shame. Morocco now owed Spain a near unpayable 100 million francs. To ensure this payment, Spain held the city of Tehuatan until the 100 million francs were paid in full. The Moroccans would never regain this occupied city. To help finance this new debt was the British Empire, who was eager to loan Morocco more money that they could simply not pay back. Sultan Mohammed IV's first half year as Sultan was marked by war, but his whole 13 years after, that would be marked by near complete peace. Sultan Mohammed IV attempted to modernize Morocco, bringing in the first steam powered engines and printing presses into the country. He also attempted to modernize the Moroccan army. Other than this, Sultan Mohammed IV dedicated himself to a life of study. He would eventually die in 1873 and would be succeeded by his son, Sultan Hassan. And just like his father, the opening days of his reign would be consumed by war. Not from an outside power this time. Instead, there was a revolt directly in his own capital of Fez. Sultan Hassan quickly ended this rebellion. The Fez revolt showed him two pressing issues. One, Morocco needed to continue in its modernization policies, especially with the military. Two, Moroccan central authority was weak, and certain ethnic groups had far too much local autonomy. He worked on both of these things, increasing the central authority of his state. Six years into his reign, the British Empire occupied the town of Tarfeya in the south of Morocco. So much for that Anglo-Moroccan Treaty of Friendship, right? A year later, Morocco was forced to sign the Treaty of Madrid by its colonial predators, France, Britain, and Spain. This treaty formally ceded all Moroccan land under the occupation of these three colonial powers. What this really was, was a prelude to the Conference of Berlin that would occur in only five years. All the major European powers were there, and even the USA. The three-way race to colonize Morocco and the rest of North Africa was on. A year later, in 1881, on the other side of Algeria, France conquered the Beylik of Tunisia. The French quickly turned their hungry gaze towards Morocco. They occupied the eastern Moroccan territory of Tuat on the Algerian border. Sultan Hassan protested, but there was very little he could do besides prevent an all-out war. A year after this, on the opposite side of North Africa, the British Empire conquered Egypt. In that same year, the British also began to build a fort at the town of Tarfea that they had just occupied three years ago. Naming it after their queen, it would be called 
Fort Victoria, a further continuation of betrayal. In 1884, the main European powers, plus America and Japan, would attend the Conference of Berlin. This meeting would split nearly all of Africa between just a few European countries. Morocco would be split between France and Spain. But first, these countries had to conquer what was left. The Conference of Berlin would be formalized in 1885. Spain wasted no time. They would take what is now considered Western Sahara. Not shown on this map, as this is the conquest of North Africa, not West Africa. As the name implies, Western Sahara is pretty much a sandy wasteland. But now, it was Spain's sandy wasteland. This was the last straw for Sultan Hassan, but he didn't take it out on the Spanish. Instead, he attacked the British at their newly built Fort Victoria. The efforts of modernizing the Moroccan army seemed to pay off, as serious enough damage was inflicted on the fort to cause the British to evacuate the area. Later in that same year, Sultan Hassan was forced to use his army again, this time quelling another internal rebellion. With Spain's occupation of Western Sahara, some inside Morocco began to see the fragility of their country. The Sous people in the south, close to Western Sahara, revolted, but were quickly stomped out. A year later, in 1887, the Reef people in the north of Morocco also revolted. This was mostly put down, but the people of the Reef remained unhappy towards their sultan. In 1893, another rebellion towards the French-Algerian border broke out and around the city of Tafalat. Again, the modernized army of Morocco put this down. These are just a few of the largest of the revolts personally put down by Sultan Hassan. Morocco was so internally fractured that all 21 years of Hassan's reign, he would be on campaign. Sultan Hassan would die in 1894, leaving a much more internally united Morocco to be passed on to his 13-year-old son, Sultan Abdulaziz. He wasn't even the eldest of Sultan Hassan's sons, but his mother, a Georgian slave woman named Lila was his favorite wife. The Grand Vizier, a man named Ahmad bin Musa, would act as a regent for the young Abdulaziz. After six years of regency under Grand Vizier Ahmad, he would die. The now 19-year-old Abdulaziz took on the full responsibility of Sultan. And boy was he happy about it. I mean, just look at that smile. A year after this, Abdulaziz was presented with his first challenge. France had started taking the remainder of what is now Algeria, firmly surrounding Morocco along with Spain. On top of this, France decided to formally annex the Tuat region of Morocco that they had occupied for the past 20 years. Abdulaziz did little. The people's trust in their young sultan began to wane. Further moves would be made by France, who chipped more away from the south of Morocco. The Moroccan locals fought back against the French Abdulaziz simply looked the other way. To make matters even worse, another famine rocked Morocco and saw many starve in between the years of 1903 and 1907. Further discontent drew towards Abdulaziz. Some Moroccans decided to further show off this weakness. On May 18th of 1904, a man named Ion Perticaris, along with his wife and stepson, were taken hostage by the Jabala tribe of North Morocco. The leader of this tribe was a man who was known as Raisuli, and man does he look scary. Raisuli, although a hardened criminal, was something of a Moroccan Robin Hood. Taking families hostage and selling them for ransom money was just something that he did. But this time, it was different. Ion Perticaris was an American citizen, and his wife and stepson, they were British citizens. This hostage crisis would have went unnoticed had it not been an election year in America. An election year that featured sitting president Theodore Roosevelt, that is. Teddy immediately sent a squadron of American ships to get Perticaris back. You would think America would pay to get its own citizens back, but you'd be wrong. Instead, they threatened and forced Abdulaziz to pay the $2 million ransom in today's money. Rightfully so, the Sultan did not want to throw money away towards the hands of one of his greatest rivals. The American response was concise. 
Either you pay the ransom, or we take a field trip into Morocco to find and kill Raisuli. The Sultan folded and paid the ransom. The Americans also forced him to pay for their voyage to and from Morocco as well. America even forced Abdelaziz to make this bandit, Raisuli, a governor of the Jabala province. This, however, did not last long, as Raisuli continued in his piratical tendencies. Once again, Abdelaziz was bullied by external and internal foes. A few hundred miles away, one of the greatest rivalries in world history was becoming one of the strongest alliances in recent memory. I am, of course, talking about the British and French empires. On April 8th of 1904, both empires signed the Entente Cordiale. This was not as much of an alliance, rather than it was a scheme to equally split the majority of Earth between them. Among the many agreements in the treaty was an article about Morocco. Britain decided to completely remove themselves from Moroccan politics and leave the country to France's will. Since the Anglo-Moroccan Treaty of Friendship in 1856, the British Empire acted as Morocco's protector. Although they weren't very good at it, this treaty took at least some of the colonial heat off. The gate was now open for a total conquest. Well, they were open briefly, until a new European power protested. The rising German Empire was always trying to get in the way of their French rival. In fact, the whole conception of Germany as a unified country only came about after the Franco-Prussian War. The alliance of Germany's two biggest competitors left the nation-state desperate to block any expansion of France's power. This would all culminate in 1905, in what was called the First Moroccan Crisis. On the last day of March in 1905, German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm II arrived in the city of Tangier. Here, he gave a speech addressing that he, and Germany, would be the new protector of Moroccan independence. Sultan Abdelaziz couldn't be happier, immediately cutting all ties with France. A chance to play two predatory powers off one another was a chance Morocco literally could not pass up and still expect to be independent within a decade. France threatened to declare war on Germany, and then Germany backed off and agreed to attend the Algericus Conference in 1806. Algericus was a city in southern Spain. This conference was attended by a usual host of European colonial powers, so this was really more like a shakedown. Sultan Abdelaziz was basically being asked to hand over his entire country's tax base. By the end of the conference, Sultan Abdelaziz could not sign it. He walks away from the negotiation table. However, after two months, the Sultan agrees to the treaty. France immediately invades. In March of 1907, a French doctor named Emily Machamp was murdered by a mob in the city of Marrakesh. This is obviously terrible, but France decided to use this murder as an instigation for war. In just a week, France would begin their invasion of Morocco from Algeria. They captured the border city of Oujda, sitting on this initial victory for the better part of four months until the French made their next move. In July of 1907, the French Navy would continue in their tradition of bombing Moroccan cities. This time, they laid waste to Casablanca, leveling buildings, all for the death of one man. Thousands of civilians died as a result. For two days, the French bombed the 30,000 residents to the point of wide-scale evacuation. At the end of the carnage, a French Marine Corps lands to occupy the rubbled city of Casablanca, capturing it on August 7th of 1907. Sultan Abdelaziz was continuing to lose confidence with his people. At the same time, his brother, Abdal Hafid, seemed to be gaining support. If Sultan Abdelaziz was going to let European powers step all over him, maybe his brother wouldn't. The south of Morocco began supporting Abdal Hafid. Using his position of Khalifa of Marrakesh, given to him by his brother, he begins a coup. In February of 1908, he proclaims himself as the Sultan of Morocco, in direct opposition to Abdelaziz. Centering his control in Marrakesh and Fez, all he had to do now was wait for his younger brother to arrive. 
On August 19th of 1908, the fate of the Moroccan Sultanate would be chosen at the Battle of Marrakesh. This was less of a battle and more of an ambush. Sultan Abdelaziz would run to the safety of the French-controlled city of Casablanca, where he would abdicate two days later. With the seemingly pro-European Abdelaziz gone, it was time to see what the anti-colonial Abdelafid could do to prevent further conquest. One of the promises he made to his nobles before becoming the Moroccan Sultan was to recapture the occupied cities of Casablanca and Oujda. Politicians and promises usually don't go well together, and that's just the case here, as these cities would not be reclaimed by Morocco for decades to come. Realizing, as his younger brother had, that there was almost no use in fighting France and Spain, Abdallah Fid did little more than sit on his hands. Again, the only hope Morocco had for survival was to play the European powers off of one another. As French soldiers began encroaching deeper into Morocco, an old rival of France protested the move. As they had five years ago, Germany would intervene on behalf of Morocco. But only because Spain and France weren't sharing with them. This time, instead of simply promising to protect Morocco, they actually sent a warship to block French advancements. Negotiations between France and Germany began a week later. Unsurprisingly, Morocco was not even invited to discuss the sovereignty of their own country. With Britain mediating, Germany agreed to allow France and Spain to do what they wished in Morocco. In return, Germany was granted land in modern-day Cameroon to add on to their colony there. This political back and forth on two separate occasions can be viewed as one of the many contributing factors that led up to the soon-to-come World War I. In March of 1912, French soldiers occupied the extremely important city of Fès. Sultan Abdallah Fid was forced into negotiations with France. This treaty wouldn't take a chunk out of Morocco like previous ones had. Instead, France demanded that Morocco become a French protectorate. In name, Sultan Abdallah Fid would remain as a ruler, but in practice, he was now a colony of France. Abdallah Fid had done the opposite of what he had promised to do when he overthrew his brother to become the Sultan. Immediately after the French left, riots broke out in the streets of Fes. The Sultan was forced out of the city by the mob. He was later threatened to step down as Sultan by France, who granted him a large pension. In his place, the throne of Morocco sat vacant. In this vacancy, the son of a Moroccan guerrilla fighter would proclaim himself as Sultan continuing the Moroccan anti-colonial resistance. Much of southern Morocco, especially around Marrakesh, would side with Sultan Ahmed al-Hibba, who began to style himself as the Blue Sultan. Although dealing with a rebellious Sultan, France unofficially owned Morocco. Their promise to split the country between them and Spain would be fulfilled on November 27th of 1912. Meeting in Madrid, they signed a treaty that would give Spain the northern portion of Morocco, connecting the two cities that they already owned there. France was then granted the status of protecting power of Morocco, leaving them as the real ones in control. In August, France finally decided to put their own sultan on the throne, Yusuf bin Hassan, youngest brother of both previous sultans, a puppet ruler with no real power. However, in the south, the self-proclaimed Blue Sultan was still on the loose and was beginning to gain traction for his anti-imperialist cause. The French moved to firmly establish their foothold in the south, marching on the center of this rebellion, the city of Marrakesh. Sultan Ahmed al-Hibba and his resistance began targeting the French army by using hit-and-run guerrilla tactics. However, it was all for naught, as the French reached Marrakesh with only a handful of casualties. Defending the city against early machine guns and artillery, the Hibis, named after their leader Amid al-Hibba, stood no chance. 2,000 of the 10,000 Moroccans died, while another 2,000 were left wounded. The Blue Sultan was forced to flee, continuing the rebellion despite his setback. The French continued pressing to battle the self-proclaimed Sultan for the next two years. In 1914, the very same powers who had argued over Morocco, France, and Germany went to war. This was World War I. 
and it would mean a step back from less important matters in Morocco. This global conflict may have been a boon for the Hibis movement, but it spelled doom for many of the Moroccans already under French occupation. 40,000 Moroccans would be conscripted to fight on behalf of France and the Entente. They participated as early as two months after the start of the war and are featured in almost every major battle of the war, including Verdun and Artois. Over the four year duration of the war, the Moroccans would suffer 10,000 casualties. Some of those who refused to join the French army instead began their own revolt. In roughly the middle portion of French Morocco, the Zayan Confederation of Berber Tribes was established. Formed after the alliance of three Berber tribes and led by one of their chiefs, Muha U Hamu Zayani. This rebellion split French Morocco nearly in half. Unsurprisingly, this Zayan Confederation would find a natural ally in the Central Powers, especially Germany and the Ottoman Empire, who began supplying the Zayan militarily. Now with two rebellions raging in their new protectorate, France began to send more soldiers, taking men away from the European theater. The Zayan and French armies would give battle on November 13th of 1914, five months after the start of World War I. French Colonel René Lavadour took the initiative by ambushing the main Zayan war camp. At first, this caught the Zayan by surprise and led to a few hundred of them dying as they retreated to a nearby hill. Colonel Lavadour then looted the camp while the Zayan leader, Chief Zayani, began to set his trap. The 1,200 men under Lavadour concluded their raid on the camp and began returning to the nearby fort that they garrisoned. The French column immediately encountered small bands of Zayan. The column continued, but was reportedly suddenly set upon by 5,000 Zayan warriors. They first targeted the exposed back of the column, where the bulk of the French artillery was located. They managed to encircle nearly the whole column and began the slaughter of the routing French as they ran all the way back to their fort. Nearly half of the force was killed, including Colonel René Lavadour. Lavadour kind of deserved this one. He made this bold move to attack the Zion camp without even asking permission from his superiors. Colonel Lavadour only left an ironic note stating that he was leaving to annihilate the Zion camp. The rest of the Zion War past 1918 was much of a foregone conclusion as World War I had ended and France could shift full attention to this small confederacy that was no longer receiving arms from Germany or the Ottoman Empire. The rebellion still continued alongside the southern uprising of Amid al hiba the Blue Sultan. After nine years of fighting the French in a guerrilla war, the Blue Sultan would pass away at the age of 41 due to a sudden illness. His title and failed dynastic coup would be passed on to his brother, but he would never gain anywhere near the support that Amid al hiba had inspired. Now Morocco only had one, albeit puppeted, sultan. The Zayan War struggled along until 1921, finally falling to French conquest. However, as one rebellion faltered, another was forming in the north of Morocco. The area, known as the Reef Mountains, occupied by the Spanish Protectorate of Morocco, declared their independence and organized a government called the Republic of the Reef. Its president was a man named Abdelkrim, a soon-to-be master innovator of guerrilla warfare. <laughs>